Dr. Jane Goodall, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Uh, this is Jane Goodall, and how are you reading me? One, two, three, four. Dr. Goodall, this is Mike Fossum, the commander of Expedition 29 on the space station with my crewmate Satoshi Furukawa, and we hear you excellently. And I hear you excellently, and Mike and Satoshi, and I'm really excited to be talking to you. And I thought I would start off by giving you the greeting of the chimpanzee, the distance call. We're ready. And this could be good morning or it be, could be konnichiwa. <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. Thank you very much. Well, what an honor it is to speak to you, uh, Dr. Goodall. It, it, you know, you've been an inspiration for all of us that, that, that love science and learning about our world. Well, I'm very excited talking to you. And, you know, the year I set out for Gombe National Park in 1960 was about the time that the first chimpanzee ham was shot into space, preceding all of the astronauts. I, of course, they uh, they really helped pave the way and prove that 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 uh, primates, that living animals, could survive the uh, the exposure to the space in the zero zero gravity environment. Yes, and and I met some of the early astronauts. You know, I met John Glenn several times, and also Buzz Aldrin, and a couple more as well. Well, they are. Definitely heroes to us. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of, of, of uh, John Glenn, Buzz Aldrin, and, you know, and, and all of the guys that came before us that have led through the 50 years now of human spaceflight to have led us to where we are today with this great laboratory 240 miles above the Earth with 15 nations in cooperation. Well, you know, it's fantastic. And there's your lab. I, I gather it's about the size of a football pitch. And it's still going 50 years after these first flights into space with the chimps. And the Gombe National Park, where I do my research, is still going 50 years later. And that's quite a lot bigger with chimpanzees living in the wild and lots of forests. So very different places, but we're still going and we're still finding new things. And what sort of science are you doing up there? Uh, we have a, a wide variety of science uh, from uh, actual crystal growth kinds of things uh, to plant growth. Uh, uh, there's a, a combustion experiments looking at uh, the, the breaking into the real physics of the flame in the zero gravity environment. You take away the convection currents and, and you can understand a little more of the details of, of of the flame and looking for ways to buy just a small percentage of efficiency in a combustion process, for instance. Uh, as well as we are the guinea pigs up here. We're the primates that are being investigated up here as they, they uh, were carefully monitored for bone loss, muscle loss, and a lot of other ill effects or potential ill effects from long-term exposure to these uh, microgravity environment. Well, I gather, Mike, that You've been up there, you know, quite a lot of time. You've been living there six months. And um, uh, I think, Satoshi, you've been there for three months or something like that. I was sort of hoping I'd see you floating about upside down and things. Oh, we can arrange for that. Absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, that's, that's no problem. And uh, we've, well, we've both been up here, uh, you know, and and have adapted quite well to what it's like to be in zero gravity. Well, it would be absolutely fascinating. I know John Glenn flew when he was 77. That's the age I am now. Maybe one day I come and visit you up there. Ah, you see? That's fantastic. I, 
Yeah. Fantastic. Hold hold that thought. I I think you we're really on to something. Our most seasoned experienced astronaut flew at 77. And so I think uh, we need to get you up here to study the world from a different point of view instead of down in the micro point of view from the macro point of view to see the the beautiful rainforests as we fly over them. It's just astonishing. Okay, well um I really really appreciate that uh, little show of being without gravity. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, and I have one question. Um, from up there, can you, can you see something of the damage that our human behavior is inflicting on this poor old planet? Can you, can you see anything about the health of the planet and the, and the atmosphere from where you are? Uh, one thing that's been of interest lately, of course, with the the, the terrific uh, wildfires in Texas, uh, where, where I grew up, uh, as you could see that, that smoke haze stretching really across the planet, uh, particularly strong right in the local area, but you see that haze that stretches across the planet. There's parts of our globe that have fires on a, a fairly routine basis as they clear the land, uh, and you can see that. You can see uh, down in South America where the, the land is being cleared, and anytime there's a road put through, you can see the the, the rainforest actually being um, uh, being cut into along the road as the as the the you know the people are trying to find a way to farm and uh, and to live and and using it in that way. I was struck just this weekend watching a pass over. I was taking photos going over South America, and you know you, have, you start off coming west toward the east in general, and so you have the fantastic uh, Andes Mountains and and then you kind of entered into the uh, the drainage of the Amazon River. And it, it struck me that the ground looked black and unbroken except for the rivers that were flowing through it. And you're not used to seeing that. In most places of the globe, you see where we're, 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 uh, we have carved roads, uh, towns, cities, or, or forestry. You see how we're, you know, using uh, or, or harvesting forests, and in this area, it struck me that it was totally black. It didn't look green; it looked black, or very, very, very dark green, and that was untouched. Uh, and uh, what I saw was just the the untouched top canopy of the forest down there. It was quite marvelous. Well, that's terrific. I I'm just thinking that there's a synergy between you guys up there. And what we, the Jane Goodall Institute, are trying to do with conservation of the forests on the ground and, and monitoring what's going on, the sort of work we're doing with, with Esri and Digital Globe. Maybe we can all join forces for the sake. I know you've got children, um, Mike, you've got a grandchild. I've got three grandchildren. And the future of the planet, our precious planet, for you guys up there, um, I'm looking at it from down here. Maybe we can get together and join forces for, for the future of, of children, grandchildren, and everybody, all the animals that are out there. It is striking when you see our planet from up above. You see a world where the, the borders, those colored lines we draw on maps, don't show up. Or only in a, a couple of unique instances can you see such a thing, a man-made structure like that from, sta uh, from space. But it, to me, one of the striking things, too, is just the, the very thin atmosphere. If you stretch your arm out at, at the window and look, the atmosphere is about half the thickness of my little finger. And that's, to me, is really striking to think how thin that layer is that, that holds, you know, everything that's vital for life for us that keeps our atmosphere, that keeps the pressure, keeps the water and everything else intact for us. And uh, it's, a, it's a finite thing. We think of it looking on the ground and up at the endless heavens. We think that the atmosphere must be endless also, but it definitely is not. Uh, I, I think it's, it's very scary when I think how we, in our mindless way down here, are damaging that very precious envelope uh, from the bottom up. And uh, I, I've just been told you're flying over Western Africa, where we have projects on the ground. And, you know, sometimes when I'm in Gombe, looking up at the stars, lying on my back on the beach, uh, I can, you know, we see satellites going overhead. And 
it, now I'm actually talking to you up in a satellite, and I find this, you know, really very, very exciting. And, um, you know, we're, this, this little interview is going to be played in 500 cinemas on the 27th, right across America. And I wonder, is there anybody in those cinemas you want to say hello to? Because they'll be watching... Uh, I would like to say hello well, to all of the people that are interested in seeing this. You know, you know, we we understand and we're with you. In, in particular, I'd like to say to the to the children who are contemplating a future for themselves that science and technology are really, if you look at at the ills of the world, a lot of it could be in ways blamed on science and technology. You know, we we could blame perhaps internal combustion engines. We could blame our desire to. To, to extract ores from the ground or things like that. So in a lot of ways, the, the, the human impact on our planet has been uh, hastened by technology. But I think that technology is also our hope for finding cleaner, better ways, more efficient ways to do things. Because I don't see us turning our back on technology completely. I th and the, the challenge out there is to find ways to be smarter about it, to be cleaner about it, to be find ways of, of of using the resources we have in as renewable a way as possible. And so technology is, is, is going to help us in the future, too. You might blame it for where we are, but it also will help us in the future. And it's wonderful, exciting areas with a lot of work to do in all areas of science, technology, engineering, that many, many challenges, many opportunities, and you know, great things. And so if, if the children understand that there's their way of understanding the world, how things work, is through that science. And so they, as they lay on that beach looking up at the stars, and the science is the way of helping understand how it all happened, what puts it together. And it's a marvelous thing to, to dream about as a child and then find ways to turn into realities as an adult. Absolutely. And, you know, we have this program, Roots and Shoots, which is now in 126 countries. And it's all about science and living in harmony with the environment and dreaming about what you want to do and following that dream like I did and like you both did. And, and I think that if we link in our Roots and Shoots children who are all ages from preschool through university with what you're doing up there. I mean, this would be a whole new link. And maybe you can involve your children and your grandchild uh, with all these other children. And we can take them a whole new message and give them a whole new possibility of what they might do that they can start dreaming about. And you can encourage them. And in this way, we link the heavens with the ground through the youth. And we link today with tomorrow through the young people through science and technology, but also through our joint humanity. Oh, that's a delightful proposition. I, I'd say for Satoshi and myself, there's definitely a 12-year-old child in each of us that uh, enjoys just peering out the window up here. Uh, and I, I think that to engage children to look at the world in that way, to get out of the house, to get away from the, you know, the electric lights and the electronic um, uh, distractions and enjoy and appreciate the world, starting with a tree in their own community. Absolutely. Well, it's been really wonderful to talk with you, and you've added a whole new dimension to our event on the 27th of September. So we'll be looking at you again then, and maybe you can be looking at the program at the same time. So I, I just want to say goodbye and continue to find out new things up in your little lab in the up in the up in the um, above the planet. And I'll be doing my bit down on the planet from the bottom. And I'll be thinking of you. So I just want to say bye bye. Well, Dr. Jane Goodall, the honor is ours. It is truly an honor to, to meet you. You've been an inspiration to us and, and uh, for, for generations. And thank you very much for your interest in, in the, the human spaceflight program. Uh, we're proud of the work we're doing here on the, uh, on the space station. And uh, just thank you very much. And good day.
Good day. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jane Goodall. Station, please stand by while we reconfigure video and audio communications.